the United States has recovered, and it's certainly the healthiest of Western nations. There are some glitches to watch, though. So we've asked Maria Owens Thompson, chief economist at Crédit Agricole Private Banking in Switzerland, to join us to comment on some of the indicators. Marie, welcome back to the studio. Thank you so much. So we're going to start with the meaning of some of the figures we're watching all the time. One of them is GDP growth. So what, how does that compare with the European figures? Ah, I love this uh, opportunity to talk about this, although one could think that one has to be an economist to feel passionately about definitions, but definitions are actually really important and they play with our minds. And uh, the US uh, way of uh, defining their growth is quarter on quarter. They take the quarter on quarter change and they multiply it by four. And they call this annualized. Whereas in Europe or in the rest of the world really, uh, changes are expressed either in quarter-on-quarter quarter changes or year-on-year year changes and nobody multiplies anything by anything. So, uh, of course, when you do this, uh, you, you get the impression that the US figures are four times as large as they really are. So, I am convinced that this plays on people's perception uh, because normal people are not so involved in these definitions and, uh, and we therefore have a, a bias in our thinking, which tends to make us all think that the US is healthier than it is and that Europe is sicker than it is. Whereas in reality, the difference between the two is not as great. So what, what is the real figure if we measure it in European terms? Ah, still enviable, definitely. The US is still growing at a faster clip than Europe, there's no doubt about it. But the Q2 figure, for instance, for 2014, is published on an annualized basis as 4.6% growth, which sounds just phenomenal, but the quarter on quarter change is only 1.15. Whereas in Europe is 0.9 and something similar. Well, yes, in, uh, absolutely. I mean, the first quarter has been, the first half of the year has been really disappointed, disappointing in Europe. But if we look at what we think is going to happen for the year as a whole, we think that U the US will grow at almost 2% and Europe at almost 1%. So Europe is, uh, the US is growing twice as fast as, uh, as Europe, but not four times as fast. Okay. On other figures which are much debated, uh, you, the deficit, I mean, the US news have been very bullish on the deficit. Uh, you are not so bullish. Can you explain why? Yeah, so this is uh, really, it ties in with the November midterm elections, actually, you know, and the political stalemate that we have in the US since, uh, since, since 2011, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, since then, the, the Americans cannot agree on anything. So the spending cuts that we've had in the US have all fallen on discretionary spending, which is the category of spending that was already falling. So it's all current spending cuts. And uh, if we compare with Greece, for instance, uh, and when at the height of the European crisis and everybody was saying that Greece wasn't doing what they were supposed to do because they were only cutting discretionary spending. Well, that's exactly what we have in the US. And the category of spending, which is actually problematic and rising structurally, uh, this is uh, Medicare, Medicaid and Social Security spending. They're all tied to the aging population and because they can't agree on how to reform these programs, uh, there's no uh, improvement in sight on that score. So spending structurally increases in the US and the spending cuts to discretionary spending is actually regrettable. It's what we want them to spend money on in order to improve growth in the future. Okay, so eventually this is going to have an effect on debt particularly if interest rates rise. Yes, exactly. We would expect uh, the, the deficit to start growing again uh, sometime around 2015 or 16. And uh, another impact, of course, on the spending will be the higher interest rates that given the record low levels we have today, we all expect them to rise in the future, of course, and, and servicing the debt is a big expense as well. So those two things uh, together, we will probably have a, a debt to GDP ratio uh, at very close to 80% uh, of US GDP in the coming 10 years. And this is not the only thing to watch. There's another little animal that people don't always look at very closely, which is inventory. Hmm. So 
I know it's one of your favorite topics. Definitely. Um, and imagery has been rising. And what does that mean? What implication does it have on the figures that we're watching? Hmm. I mean, inventory growth is, of course, growth. But the object of, of creating inventory is that you sell it. So, so over a long period of time, uh, the, the, the inventory you accumulate then drops again. Yeah? So, so the contribution to GDP over a longer period of time has to be zero. Uh, you cannot build a growth strategy on inventory buildup. And the US is now in a, a phase of inventory buildup, a very strong such phase since 2013. So uh, 2013, there was a lot of inventory buildup. We had a bit of a correction in the first quarter. And now again, in the second quarter, inventory contributed as much as 1.4% of the 4.6% growth uh, stated for that quarter. So that's 30% of the growth comes from stock building. So the problem with this is that at one point there will be another inventory correction. So th it again plays on people's minds that we see these large numbers and we're not necessarily aware of the fact that uh, they're likely to be a lot smaller at some point in the future. Now, on, a, on another topic, uh, which uh, kind of worries you as well, is that the tax competitiveness of the US is not very good. In fact, from what you've told me earlier and from what we can see on this table, um, it's not that much better than France. I know. Which is very surprising. I know. When I speak to Americans, they don't like it when I compare them to France. <laughs> but. Uh, but the, there's definitely more similarities there than meets the eye, perhaps. And uh, indeed, our perceptions, it's like we have a hard time having our minds evolving at the same pace as the world is changing. And who has noticed, for instance, that Sweden has done so much tax reform that they are now among the world's most tax competitive nations? Um, Just below Switzerland. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, that, that was certainly not the case uh, you know, ten, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, so a huge structural change in Sweden and no structural change in the US, which then still lumbers with a highly regulated and, and very cumbersome tax system. And again, w what kind of hopes can we hold out for that to change? Well, scant, because in the November midterm elections, the Senate uh, is, you know, could well become Republican, have a Republican majority as well. And, uh, and the president is reduced to his veto and executive powers. So it's not the right environment where we can think that they will uh, somehow miraculously uh, arrive at a big bipartisan tax reform. So, uh, so this will weigh on, on the U.S. Uh, at least until 2016 when there are new presidential elections. Well, Marie, thank you very much for joining us today. Always a pleasure.